All right. Hello, class. Welcome to lecture 19. We're going to continue our discussion of phase transitions and criticality and specifically continue considering this canonical model, this concrete example of a system by which we hope to get some insight into notions of universality, quantify things like critical exponents, and in the process, be able to relate concepts like symmetry breaking to what are really spectacular transitions that happen in our day-to-day -day lives, a phase transition whereby molecules spontaneously rearrange themselves macroscopically from one state of matter to the other is, a spec is really a, a phenomenal thing to observe. And we're trying to really get the statistical mechanics of such transitions right. So we ended up last lecture having introduced a couple models for magnetization or for lattice gases or liquid vapor transitions. We demonstrated that those models were the same. Those are, that was an example of an exact equivalence one can draw between those two specific models. And so we hoped that we can take one of those models and show or demonstrate that it did indeed predict criticality and criti you know, associated critical exponents. But when we solved the one-dimensional Ising model, we found that there was no spontaneous symmetry breaking. There is no critical point in associated divergence of the heat capacity or susceptibility. There was no long range order ever present in a one-dimensional Ising model. So one of the things we're gonna to do today is talk about the role that dimensionality plays in phase transitions giving you some examples of arguments that really show that one dimension is special, two dimensions already is sufficient to give the sorts of behavior um, one would like to see or one observes experimentally. Talk about really in detail what we mean by dimensionality before we begin at the end of this lecture with an undertaking that will take a couple week, you know, take a, another week to really flesh out which is how to approximately solve the Ising model in cases where it is capable of giving back critical behavior of breaking spontaneously the up-down symmetry which it has in it. All right, but before we go down that path, let's remind ourselves kind of where we've been. So we have quite a lot discussed the notion of universality. This is again that near the critical temperature, molecular details really don't matter. Whether or not I'm considering a simple magnet or a liquid vapor transition, whether or not that liquid vapor transition is in water or in argon or in methanol, if we look really close to the critical temperature, all of those seemingly disparate systems act in the exact same way. In fact, they act in a quantifiably exact way, this exact same way. One quantifies this universe, universal behavior through a set of so-called critical exponents. which for which all phase transitions or all systems that exhibit a phase transition in the same class have the same set of critical exponents. And we've given some examples of these exponents. So one, is how the order parameter varies as it approaches the critical temperature. So for a magnet, this might be the magnetization. 
it would go as a power law with t minus tc to some critical exponent beta for a liquid vapor transition. The order parameter is the density for something like a miscibility transition. The order parameter would be the amount of one phase in the other. All of those seemingly disparate order parameters act in the same way approaching the critical point. The heat capacity, if measured upon approaching a critical point for all of those different sorts of systems, similarly behaves with a power law that diverges with some finite exponent alpha, turns out to be close to a 10. And finally, we've introduced a susceptibility, which is how the order parameter changes with an applied field. So for a magnet, this might be how the magnetization changes with an applied external magnetic field. For a like a vapor transition, this might be how the density varies as a function of pressure. For all of these, there is a power law behavior with some critical exponent gamma. This demonstrates that all of these very different systems have, in a, have an approximate equivalence near TC. They all act in similar ways, quantifiably similar ways upon approaching TC, but away from TC, we certainly know that a magnet is not a liquid. There are other properties of a magnet that are very dissimilar from that of a liquid. We're not trying to claim that those are the same materials, that if I poke or prod it in, different, in the same way, I should, should expect to get the same response. However, what is fascinating is that some properties really do act in the same way. Now, this notion that molecular details don't matter should have some, there should be at least a little intuitive when you remember that underlying this critical behavior are correlation lengths that are becoming really, really large, macroscopically so. So observables, expectation values that I would try to compute for a system, probabilistically are always averages over some underlying distribution if that distribution is filled with correlated variables so that any one fluctuating component, be it a molecule or a spin, contributes very weakly to that expectation, then it makes sense that when one probes a system, one sees not the details of the individual components, but their aggregate consequence. One doesn't measure in noting the heat capacity near the critical point, the different modes which are fluctuating independently of the vapor, rather the vapor as a body fluctuating on macroscopic scales. This approximate equivalence and this lack of, or this seeming lack of molecular detail being important motivated us to construct and study simple models of these transitions. For example, in the context of a magnetization transition, we've introduced and begun studying the so-called Ising model. Model of a magnet, magnet is made out of spins. Those spins could be coupled through some exchange coupling with strength J. If we make a really simple model, then these spins live on the lattice and they only interact with nearest neighbors. In addition, I can break the up-down symmetry by applying a field and thus favor, say, spin up with positive H or spin down with negative H. With these, microscopic spin variables being up or down, plus or minus one. We've also introduced simple models of liquid vapor transitions. For example, with the interacting lattice gas, instead of the energy going up in the Boltzmann factor, as one would do for a canonical ensemble, a lattice gas is something whose energy as well as particle number fluctuates. So going up in the exponent is the energy plus mu times the total number of particles. That 
combined factor in the lattice gas has an energetic contribution, which depends on these occupation variables in, which tell me if a given cell is filled or empty. If they're both filled, there's some adhesive energy of scale epsilon that makes it favorable to have them filled. And in addition, there's some chemical potential, which is conjugate to the total number of particles in the system, computable by summing over all the cells weighted by whether or not that cell is filled or empty. Having noted these two functions, the quantities which endow get different configurations, different statistical weights, we actually were able to write one into the other and show an exact mapping between the two. By taking epsilon as 4j and mu as twice h less jz, where this z is the coordination number of the lattice. We actually found that these two different models, simple representations of magnets or the liquid vapor transitions are exactly the same model, that their partition functions were mappable up to a constant, which is irrelevant for an expectation value. By just relabeling things, these are exactly the same. So by studying one or solving one, we know exactly everything there is to know about the other. So while you might not be a big fan of magnets, you maybe, maybe resonates more with the lattice gas, you know, that's something we have more common experience with. The fact that the Ising model has a more apparent symmetry motivates us to think about it more. It's clear that at h is equal to zero, there's an up-down symmetry. The energy function is invariant to rotating all the spins. That transparency lends to some simplicity in its analysis. But it's important to keep in mind that as we progress with the Ising model, we can make equivalent statements at every point for the statistics and consequences of a system of particles on the lattice in, in so much as that is mappable to a lattice gas. One of the things we found already is that if we actually go through a pretty hairy calculation using these transfer matrices, and actually solve exactly the one-dimensional Ising model for which those transfer matrices work very well, we found that in 1D for these models, that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. There is no critical point at finite temperature. That's a real bummer because we've elaborated on some real highfalutin ideas that says that, yeah, we should be able to get away with studying very simple models. When we actually do study that simple model in a lot of detail, we found at least in one dimension that it doesn't give back the behavior we're hoping to study. There is no critical transition. There's no spontaneous symmetry breaking whereby the system macroscopically assembles itself into an all up or all down phase. So pessimistically, one might think that the model is just not complicated enough that maybe we need to add some bells and whistles. But what we'll actually talk about today is that it's actually 
the particular realization we studied in that we put it in one dimension, which makes it different. In fact, the first real lesson of today is that dimensionality really matters in discussions of phase transitions. And in fact, 1D is kind of special. That's a terrible special, let me try that again. Okay, so let's talk about that. So why might 1D be special? What's going on in a one-dimensional Ising model that causes there to be no spontaneous symmetry breaking? Okay, so this argument that I'm gonna present to you goes back to Landau who is really the father of modern phase transition theory. So Landau had a simple argument and it goes something like this. Let's consider a one dimensional Ising model in its ground state. So which ground state, you might ask? There are two, of course, at exactly zero temperature, having a system in, all, in an all up state, it should be equally likely as an all down state, but let's for concreteness, imagine we have the system in the all up state. So that the magnetization of that chain is positive and finite. Now, if we were to raise the temperature an infinitesimal amount, we could ask the question, what is the cheapest energetic excitation that results in there being no net magnetization? So exactly at zero temperature, we can have an all up state and at zero temperature, there are no fluctuations. So it would persist in that all up state. We could prepare the system in the all down state. And again, at zero temperature, barring quantum mechanical effects, so a classical spin chain, it would remain all down. So at zero temperature, there is some sense in which there's a symmetry breaking. I prepare the state in one of those arrangements, it will, persist like that forever. However, if I allow for excitations, if I allow for a fluctuation to occur, one could ask, what is the lowest line excitation? What is the smallest fluctuation I can have, which results in no net magnetization, which destroys that spontaneous symmetry breaking? And that's easy to imagine. So if I have all up to begin with, well, the A way to result in no net magnetization would be to take half of those spins and point them down. And if I choose to take half that are a block that are attached to each other, and you put all of them down collectively, then what, what I have done is I've only introduced two, those two at the boundaries 
of those blocks, which are now energetically in an unfavorable position. Everyone else is just as happy as they were initially in the ground state because they are paired up with spins of the like sign. So this defect, the boundaries of these domains of all up or all down is what we call a domain wall. And the associated energy increase from the ground state energy of that defect is twice the exchange coupling J. So to go from the state up here to the state down there, I increase the energy by an amount of 2J asso associated with breaking one favorable interaction between the spins in the box from what they were previously as some favorable interaction. So the contribution to the energy of the original pair was minus J. It now becomes plus J. So the net change is twice J. And by doing that simple excitation, that simple flip of half of the spins, I've destroyed the net magnetization in the system. Okay, so if we're talking about the energetics of this process, the, the thermodynamics of this process, excuse me, there's a contribution from energetics, but there's also a contribution from entropy, from the number of ways that I could have this excitation exist. So how many ways? Could I put that defect down on the lattice? Well, if I have n plus one spins, as we discussed in the live session the other day, that means that there are, if the chain is not on a ring, that means that there will be n ways that I could have broken that bonded pair. Now, all of those different ways of introducing that domain wall are isoenergetic. They have the exact same energy independent of where I put them. So I can associate with that domain wall in entropy, which is the number of ways that that excitation can happen at fixed energy, which the energy is constant, it's all going to be 2J at fixed particle or spin number and fixed volume, the length of the chain. From Boltzmann, that entropy is KB log, the number of ways it can happen in this case, KB log N. So now free energetically, The free energy change associated with this domain wall or defect, call it the Helmholtz free energy delta A, is the energetic contribution minus T times the change in the entropy. The energetic contribution we've established is 2J, the entropic minus KBT log N. Now note, the Himmel tree energy, something you expect to depend on the size of the system. The energy of that domain wall, however, does not depend on the size of the system. It is system size intensive. The number of bonds I have to break in order to have this excitation is just one. That's a special feature of a one-dimensional system that a surface in 1D is a point. 
associated with that point is a point energy, an energy that does not depend on the scale of the system. However, the entropic contribution does depend on the size of the system. And consequently, as the chain gets larger, as n goes to infinity, delta a will go to minus infinity. Something that has a net negative change in the free energy is going to happen spontaneously. So in this case, we've just demonstrated that domain walls, that defects, that destroy the symmetry broken state, the all up or all down state, will proliferate, will be generated spontaneously. Just to be concrete for what I mean by long range order, it means that in the ground state, if I say that one of the spins is up, I know in the ground state that all of the spins are up. So by knowing a piece of local information, like the value of one of the spins, I know information about what the rest of the spins are doing far down the chain or at very large scales. Once I have this domain wall, if the domain walls proliferate, I no longer have that long range order. I no longer know that there are big chunks of spins up separated from spins down. This argument, if you look into the details, didn't so much depend on the specifics of the Ising model Rather, it's the geometry of a one-dimensional object. In one dimension, the fact that the surface, the boundary for which two domains will be put in contact with each other does not scale with the system size. So in general, I should expect that the energetic contribution to introducing a defect does not scale with the system size. But the number of ways I could put them down will always scale with the length of the chain. So very generically, Landau would have said that there are no transitions that result in broken symmetry in 1D. And this is almost correct. For those of you who are curious, you can ask me in the live session about some exceptions to this rule. A very famous one comes from a very noted theoretical physicist noted for his contributions to the foundation of quantum mechanics, Freeman Dyson. Freeman Dyson worked out a, a nice exception to this rule, but it's a fairly exotic sort of exception. Okay. So that's what happens in one dimension. But as we've alluded to already, this is special to 1D. In fact, if we try to generalize this argument to a two-dimensional system, it's so again for concreteness, imagine we have some Ising model living in two dimensions. So we have some periodic arrangement of spins. Let's start them all in the ground state. So imagine they're all pointing up. Such that the magnetization is finite and positive. So this would be an example of a ground state of the system. A system I could I could prepare and would exist 
an infinite amount of time at zero temperature. Now, if I have n spins in the system, that would mean that each side has the square root of n if I live on a square lattice. So if I square lattice, the number of spins in that square would be the length times the length of the length squared. If the num total number of spins is n, then the square root of that is n to the 1 half. So now let's play the same game. Let's imagine we take that ground state and work out the cheapest excitation that results in no net magnetization. Let's see if I can be clever here. Hey, that mostly worked. Ooh, I can even auto align. Isn't that nice? So the cheapest excitation would be something completely localized. That would just be to take one of those spins in the ground state, flip it upside down. But such an excitation would not result in no net magnetization. In fact, if the system size were infinite, the magnetization would hardly know the difference if you flipped one or not. The analogous excitation, which results in no net magnetization, so n is zero, would be again to take half of them and flip them upside down. And the cheapest one will be the one that minimizes the number of broken favorable interactions, which means that I take one contiguous block and I flip it upside down and put it in contact with another continuous block of the half remaining spins. All right, now let's work out the thermodynamics of such a excitation. So what now is the energetic change? Well, for each bond that I break, I know that I'm going to increase the energy by twice J. That's what we had before. And so now I just need to count up the number of interactions that I've made unfavorable. So there's one right here, there's one right here. In fact, I just have to go down that interface and count them all up. And I've conveniently already worked out how many there are. That's n to the one half. What is the analogous entropic contribution? Well, again, those are all isoenergetic. So I can use Boltzmann's equation kb log, the number of ways I could put down this interface. There are n to the one half different ways I could put it as I marched it at different points along that box. I could draw the interface horizontally or vertically. So there's two times the number of ways into the one half that I could put that interface down. So now you should already be noting something distinct. Here the energetic contribution scales with the system size. So when I add these components up, the change in the free energy goes like twice j into the one half minus one half kbt log to n. Now as I take the n goes to infinity limit. As long as j is finite and positive, delta a will go to something large and positive. So it will be unfavorable for that domain to be spontaneously generated. So in fact, the system will prefer preferentially, preferentially keep such defects from occurring. It requires a huge amount of free energy to generate that defect. And so there's a strict sense in which order, net magnetization in two dimensions is stable. Oof. 
So that's that. So one dimension really is special. One dimension, owing to the geometry of a one dimensional lot, one dimensional object, is distinct in that when I introduce a defect that is capable of destroying long range order, it is localized. It doesn't scale with the system size, unlike introducing a similar interface in a two dimensional system or any higher dimensional system does. So that's a, a necessary but not sufficient condition to demonstrate that the two dimensional Ising model specifically has a critical point. But thankfully, some very clever people have done the hard work for us to demonstrate it explicitly. So in one dimension, we've just convinced ourselves that under fairly general circumstances, there's not going to be a transition. In two dimensions, we've demonstrated that it could happen. And in fact, Lars Onsager, a real founding father of modern statistical mechanics in a real tour de force of mathematical prowess, solved exactly the two-dimensionalizing model demonstrating that indeed the Ising model has a critical temperature and he did this in 1944. The exact critical temperature for a two-dimensionalizing model turns out to be twice J over KB divided by some irrational number log of one plus the square root of two, which to very good approximation is 2.26 J over KB. So definitively, rigorously, there exists a critical transition. It took another nine or so years for somebody to generalize his solution for finite field. Yang of high energy physics fame solved it for finite H, I believe in 53, demonstrating in the same amount of rigor as our transfer matrix solution that this spontaneous symmetry breaking really does exist, that there's a net magnetization with an infinite susceptibility. However, if one actually looks at their solution and asks what are the critical exponents like beta, for example, turns out to be quantitatively distinct from what we measure experimentally. However, we do experiments on liquid vapor transitions largely in three dimensions. If one solves the Ising model in three dimensions, that's freaking spectacular. No one's been able to do it. However, so not currently solvable. People are getting close. However, one can do numerical calculations with pretty significant precision. And indeed arrive at the exact critical exponents observed experimentally. So three dimensionalizing model really is as simple as it is something capable of describing real life, at least to the extent that we're interested in critical exponents. So this is again a summary that dimensionality really is very important. One dimension, there's not even a transition. In two dimensions there is, but some of the details are wrong. And in three dimensions, we really nail it. It really is exactly as one would expect. Okay, so this requires then a little bit of discussion about what exactly we mean by dimensionality. We 
live in a world in which we move around in three dimensions, does it mean that all real systems are three dimensions? Okay, so from the perspective of phase transitions and thermodynamics, what we really mean by dimensionality is the number of directions that we can take arbitrarily large. Because as we've discussed, phase transitions only exist in the thermodynamic limit. We need to have the space to observe or promote infinite or really, really large, macroscopically large correlations. And so what really counts is the number of directions that those correlations can extend over that gives us some insight that in fact, there can be real systems that are from a thermodynamics perspective, macroscopically speaking, two dimensions. A really nice example of such is a lipid membrane. So a lipid membrane, something whose lateral area one could imagine taking macroscopically large, but which has a finite thickness. So there's a little wonky cartoon of a lipid membrane. It is possible in such systems to synthesize and study lipid membranes that have mixtures of lipids, say, with differing head groups, some of which might fluoresce, for example, could be labeled. Very tedious drawing to make, but I'm sure you all appreciate it, right? All right, it's bilayer typically, so there are head groups down there too. Okay, so such systems exist, they can be made out of mixtures of lipids. What is really fantastic is that this is mixture. It's a mixture of two components. It exists in two dimensions. Two dimensions can sustain phase transitions as we've just described. And in fact, if you are to take a system like this and cool it down fairly generically, what you would find is that two dimensional objects made out of those two components can undergo a, de a demixing transition. That just like oil and water, it can phase separate. Into domains that are rich in one of those head groups and poor 
in the other. It's really dark. Ah, there we are. Need not be in each leaflet, need not be in register with the other. So you might ask then, could you measure how much the composition changes as you approach that critical temperature? If you were to measure the composition relative to the critical composition, the function of temperature relative to the critical temperature, it in fact exhibits critical scaling, has a power law dependence on the temperature with a critical exponent beta, which is exactly one eighth. Just like you would predict in an Onsager computed from the two dimensionalizing model. I think that is just the neatest thing. In fact, if you similarly think it's neat, this was actually done by initially by Sarah Keller, who is at the University of Washington. I don't know if any of you in class are from UW, you might know Sarah. She's fantastic and has systematically demonstrated that all of the critical exponents that one can predict with the two-dimensionalizing model are exactly manifested in such lipid demixing transitions. Okay, what about macroscopically one-dimensional systems? What might an example of that be? Well, a good example of that is a conjugated polymer. So such polymers may be made out of thiol rings, thiol five-membered rings. Might look like so. Little piece of that polymer. Turns out that such conjugated rings like to lie planar, but can in principle rotate about some bond vector, some bond axis. There are in such a system like I've shown, essentially two, oops, two orientations that five membered ring can point in that direction or that direction. In fact, if you look at the potential energy for moving or rotating around that bond vector, you find two pretty stable states with a big barrier in between. So in fact, to a very good approximation, such a system exists in one of two states pointing up or down, depending on the rotational angle. One can even associate a vector, call it S to the angle for the ith monomer. If one wanted to write down then the potential energy for such a system might be a sum over all the monomers. The angle that those monomers feel that they're oriented in with respect to each other with some energy scale, call it epsilon, which is computed by taking a dot product of those two bond vector, two orientational vectors. The penalization of 
pointing in the opposite direction comes from breaking conjugation. So one can lie perpendicular to the plane of conjugation, in which case there's a unfavorable interaction. However, of all of the molecules lying that same direction, you would restore that favorable energy. This was a simple mapping to the one dimensional Ising model first written down by Bob Silby in the 80s that you can go look up should you be so inclined and actually was used to, because the one dimensional Ising model is exactly computable, exactly solvable to, to a really reasonable approximation, work out the absorption spectrum of conjugated polymers. All right, we've talked about 1D and 2D. We've exist in 3D. We have common experience with it. Could we go bigger than 3D? Those are harder to realize experimentally, but certainly possible to study computationally. So if we were to summarize all of these findings for different dimensions and the role that dimension plays, say by noting a couple of the critical exponents that you'd expect in these different dimensions that are measured or observed well, in one dimension, there is no transition, so there are no associated critical exponents. In two dimensions, Ansager solved for the exponents for beta and gamma. They were given by one eighth and seven fourths, respectively. In three dimensions, careful study, either of the numerical Ising model or of experiment, results in critical exponents of 0.32 for beta and 1.2 for gamma. Four dimensions, one could measure numerically a beta of one half, kind of curious, and a gamma of one, more so. In fact, if you do this for five dimensions, you find the same exponents. You do this for six, you find the same. In fact, if you keep going to higher and higher dimensions, you keep finding the same exponents, which that is pretty curious. So while one dimension is special, two dimensions is solvable, so maybe unique, three dimensions is relevant, that's the one we live in, four and higher are all the same. So there's some commonality that sets in. Four and higher dimensionalizing models all live in the same universality class. They have the same critical exponents. That's something to consider and ponder over and something we'll try to make some sense of. But before we get there, let's now start thinking about how we can actually go about solving approximately the Ising model. It's a model that has now manifestly been capable of describing reality. So it is worth truly trying to devote some brain power into making some sense out of. So we're going to introduce a couple different strategies over the next week or so for doing this. The first of which that we'll talk about in the remaining 20 minutes or so of lecture is known as mean field theory. I'm going to develop this today somewhat heuristically. We'll do it a little more rigorously next time. So the basic idea behind mean field theory is to imagine our 
lattice of spins. Maybe like so, which are embedded in a large system. And to focus in on one of them. So let's tag that single spin. And think about what influences it to lie in a certain direction. Well, it is biased to align in the direction of a applied field. But in addition, it is influenced by its neighbors to align in the direction that they are pointing in. So one could imagine that in addition to the external field, there is an effective field from the surrounding neighbors. So if we note the energy of the Ising model as we have before is minus H sum over the spins minus J sum over spin pairs restricted to nearest neighbors. I could mathematically work out all the terms due to our single tagged spin. That would be, so for spin I, one factor in the energy that comes directly from that external field, a J coming from each of the spins SJ that are neighbors to that tagged spin I. Those are all the terms associated with spin I, so all the remainder are not related to SI. So here is a strict identification of what the net effective field that that tagged spin feels is. It is the quantity, which in this case fluctuates due to the SJs, which is conjugate in the energy to spin I. So I can write down the energy of spin I as minus H effective times SI, where this H effective is the sum of the external field plus this fluctuating interaction. Now, that field changes as these J spins change their state. So because it is a fluctuating quantity, it, for example, has a mean and a variance on average. H effective, for example, is given by H plus J however many neighbors are in that sum, call it Z. And the average value of the J spins, let's call that M. That's a little M, which is the intensive total magnetization on average 
or the expectation value of a specific spin or a spin. If all the spins are the same, it doesn't matter what their labels are. So mean field theory, the mean field approximation is to actually replace that fluctuating effective field with just its average. such that the mean field energy for spin i is just minus h plus jz, the average field or the average spin times si. So now the only fluctuating quantity in the energy for spin i is due to spin i itself. So now we have essentially made si independent of all the other spins. That quantity in the parentheses h plus jzm is just a number which biases SI to be up or down. If it's all independent, if all, if SI is now independent, it has a partition function, which is simple to compute. I need only sum over its spin states, plus or minus one, weighted by this Boltzmann factor, the mean field times the value of that spin. There are two terms in that sum, e to the beta h effective plus e to the minus beta h effective, which as you all are fast becoming facile with, can be written down in a hyper, -G, a hyper trigonomic form of twice hyperbolic cosine of beta h plus beta j z m. The average value of spin i can be computed by taking the derivative of log of q with respect to beta h, which takes the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine with respect to beta h yielding hyperbolic tangent of beta h plus beta j z m. Now the rub, the average value of spin i, if i, if that tag spin is just like all the other spins, its expectation value is the same as m. So in fact, if I insist that my theory, that my approximation is self-consistent, I now have a self-consistent equation to solve for m, the average value of the spin. So those are the two steps to mean field theory. First is replacing a fluctuating field with its average. And the second is developing a self-consistent equation that has to be satisfied for that average field. Or in this case, just expressible as the average magnetization. 
Now that's a, not an easy relationship to solve. You know, the roots of hyperbolic tangent of x minus x are not simple, not analytic, but we can get some insight into the solutions, the fixed points of the self-consistent equation by thinking graphically. Okay, so let's imagine plotting those two factors. And we're asking for where m is equal to hyperbolic tangent of beta j z m if we set h to zero. So plotting versus m, we have the line M. And now hyperbolic tangent, we know asymptotically goes to one for large positive values of its argument and negative one for large negative values of its argument. We know that it's zero at zero, but what does it do in between? Well, if beta j z is small, it's going to increase slowly. And look something like so. So in that limit that beta j z is a small number relative to one, there's only one solution. So there is no net magnetization under these circumstances. It's not really very exciting. However, if we consider a different limit, again, asymptotically, independent of everything else, it will go to plus or minus one. If beta j z is a large number, it will rise faster than m. If it rises faster than m and it plateaus, that means it must intersect m. The line m is equal to m at finite values of plus or minus m naught. So solutions to this equation are at zero and plus or minus m naught. Now that is actually really exciting. That's broken symmetry. We've just found two solutions of finite net average magnetization, one with net up, one with net down. You, you naysayers might say, well, there's a zero solution. Well, that's true. Turns out to be an unstable solution, so we can neglect it. What's important is that the number of the solutions depends on these factors, beta, j, z. And that's not a coincidence. If I take hyperbolic tangent of x and Taylor expand it to first order, it's just x. It's a strictly odd function. So that actually gets me good up to x to the three. So hyperbolic tangent of beta j 
Zm is two first order beta Jzm. So if beta Jz is less than one, m will only be zero. It will rise slow relative to the line m is equal to m and thus intersect it only at zero. If beta j z is greater than one, I'll have two stable solutions at plus or minus m naught, which will depend on those parameters. And so what we've just uncovered is that by tuning those parameters, we change between a finite magnetization and zero magnetization. That's exactly the phenomenology of our critical point. It means that we have in effect uncovered the critical temperature in this model within mean field theory, which is J Z over K B, which is pretty cool. So there is a phase transition. It happens at a finite temperature. This is fantastic. We've just done a great job. We should just call it a day. Anyone see any problems? There is one big problem. Where's dimensionality here? There's no explicit little d in the equation I've written. You might say, well, Z knows about dimensionality, which is true. Z is different in a one-dimensional chain than a two-dimensional chain or a two-dimensional square lattice. But even if I put Z as two, I'm still predicting a finite critical point even for one dimension. So that's a bummer. So this predicts correctly phase trans a phase transition in the Anzi model, but it over predicts it. It says that even in a one dimensional system, there should be a transition, which we know is not quite right. Further, if we tried to push mean field theory a little bit more, say by actually trying to see what that temperature dependence to the average magnetization was, we can do that by imagining near Tc within mean field theory. We know that the average magnetization is close to zero. If we also have H is equal to zero. So this equation M is equal to hyperbolic tangent beta J Z M. Maybe I can expand that hyperbolic tangent out slightly more. So to first order, it was beta J Z M. To third order, it was B beta J Z M cubed over three. And that would be good up to M to the five. That is a algebraic equation that we can solve in fact, there is one obvious route where m is equal to zero. That was indeed always true. But there is a non-trivial route, which is the solution to a quadratic equation that occurs for, so let's rearrange this. We have beta j z m squared by three. minus plus one minus beta j z, that must equal zero. So that gives us m is plus or minus, so there's two roots to this quadratic equation, beta j z One minus, oh, no, minus one over beta j z cubed over three. It's all under the square root. 
If I remember that TC was JZ over KB, that's a rap duo I've never seen, but would like to. I could expand for temperatures near TC. And what I would find is that the solution takes the form of TC minus T over TC to the one half, meaning the mean field critical exponent of beta is one half. So again, there's some optimistic sides of this equation, of this relationship. We've just uncovered a critical exponent. Hooray, that's pretty nifty. But that critical exponent does not depend on dimensionality. Again, just like the critical temperature does not in any non-trivial way depend on dimensionality. It is not the exponent we would have hoped in our heart of hearts we would have found. Rather, it's a rational fraction. It's a fraction, simple fraction. However, if you scroll up, beta is one half, isn't that interesting? That's what you would expect for an infinite dimensional Ising model. I'm gonna count this as a win for today. So we have done something really right in that we've gotten the right critical exponent, albeit for an infinite dimensional system. So, you know, let's, let's end this week on a positive note and call that good. So next week, we will push these, this formalism a little bit further, to develop it in a way where it's clear how we can go beyond mean field theory, how we can compute corrections to it. Again, that will be a little bit of an unfortunate tale because we'll find that such a perturbation theory is not convergent for a phase transition, at least for lots of systems we care about. But it will help us understand this phenomena we've just uncovered, which is that high dimensional lattices act like their mean field counterparts. This will eventually lead us into a discussion of a very different way of studying the Ising model, which is known as the renormalization group. So stay tuned for all of that. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the live session on Thursday.